Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming it's, and welcome to another MoTeC webinar. I'm Pete Swinney and today's subject is setting up and calibrating Lambda into an ECU. Um, yeah, it's a relatively simple task this one, and uh, but one that's often asked of our support technicians, so producing a small webinar on how to do that process. A little bit of background about us to start with. Um, Motec company itself has been around since 1987 and we have a dedicated research centre now in Melbourne here and we're Australian owned and uh, operated obviously. Our focus is on motorsport and uh, we've been listening to motorsport customers since 1987 and uh, trying to satisfy their needs. So whatever the motorsport guy wants to win as far as products from our department, ECUs and dash loggers, well, that's what we write into the software. We sell our product through 200 dealers around the world and those dealers are set up to know about the product, to sell it to their local clientele and the most importantly, support that product. So need help as a customer in the field that you should be able to find a dealer close to you. Best place to find out where your local dealer is is to simply access our website and uh, find that information there. We've got 40 staff on site there and uh, not one of them actually physically produces it, anything. All our equipment's robotically assembled uh, in a different city. Uh, we simply check it. Uh, a lot of staff doing software and uh, our operations staff doing research and support. This is the operations team from our Australian office. Uh, it's, uh, seven of us there just basically doing phone support and uh, research and testing and they're in, uh, ready to serve your needs via email or phone or whatever is required. I'd like to find out a little bit of information about the few people on today. Uh, we'll get you to fill out a little poll that I've got here. I'd like to know whereabouts you're actually from. And if I open the poll up, hopefully you'll see that. And if you could just click in the radio button as to where you're from and gather that information just lets us know who's who's attending. All right, thanks for that. So today's topics, uh, we're going to discuss sensor types and sensor wiring and heater setup and the actual sensor setup itself and the air calibration. There's uh, four types of sensors that we support in the MoTeC ECU, and, so, and when I say ECU, I'm assuming that we're going to be talking about the M400, M600, and M800 series. Um, they're all what we would call five-wire sensors. People refer to them as the five-wire sensor. Some of them actually have six, and certainly they all have six pins. The sixth pin is used as uh, an, like an internal calibration. It has a resistor across it. And some of our devices actually use that pin to do an auto calibration. Uh, those devices are our LTCs, our Lambda to CAN devices, and our professional Lambda meters. But our ECUs do not do that automatic calibration. And uh, therefore, they use only five of the wires. The five wires that are involved with the ECU setup, uh, number one is the 12 volt wire, so that's simple, you just come from a battery, battery supply. We've got a zero volt wire, which is the zero volt for the uh, sense and uh, pump current channels. We've got a heater wire, and that's basically the earth of the 12 volt. So the 12 volt supply goes down, powers the sensor up, goes through the heater and then it is grounded through an auxiliary output in the ECU and that is the heater current and the ECU actually controls the amount of heat it applies to the sensor. 
The fourth wire is the sensor voltage. So the, the sensor itself produces a voltage that we measure. And the fifth wire is a sensor current uh, value. Now the ECU also measures the current and this allows it to get a proper uh, reading. It does a calculation inside and allows you to read the true lambda reading or the air fuel ratio of the engine. Not an easy task to do properly. Uh, there are other devices out there that make an attempt at doing uh, a good job of this. The problem with measuring lambda is that you can't tell when it's wrong. If you have a lambda sensor uh, hooked to an external device of some, some sort and it displays, let's say, for example, say a 0 0.80 lambda, then how would you know if that had an incorrect reading of 0.05? The reality is you really can't know. So it's always a pays to certainly use quality lambda measurement devices. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get big inconsistencies not easy to do properly. The first sensor that I've given you in the example there is the Bosch LSU 4.0. This is the first one that came on the market to the best of my knowledge and you can identify it by the big wide connector there. It's an easy way of identifying it. It's also got Bosch written on it if you look closely enough. Um, but five or six years I'd guess these have been out if not longer. The measurement range of this sensor is lambda 0.65 to lambda 32, which is effectively fresh air. One thing about these more modern uh, five wire sensors is that they will measure uh, all the way out to absolute fresh air. So that's actually lambda 32. The Bosch range of sensors measure as rich as lambda 0.65. Now, most people would suggest that that's uh, incredibly rich and you wouldn't need to measure down at that lower end. But if you have a methanol engine with uh, running two or three bar of boost pressure, down around those kind of lambda readings is where you would start to tune it. You may end up with, say, lambda 0.72, but when you're first getting the engine going, often it might be a richer than that and you certainly aim to start richer. And so it'd be nice to know just how much richer than your ideal number of, say, 0.72 were. So the Bosch sensor measures all the way down to 0.65. If that was petrol at 0.65, the black smoke would be, uh, be horrendous, I'd suggest. Okay, the next sensor that effectively came on the market, and it was at a similar time as the NTK, it's quite a unique sensor. An NTK uh, only have one particular type uh, that's usable by our ECU. Uh, Bosch have three and the NTK has one. The NTK sensor from our testing has shown to be a slightly more reliable sensor than the Bosch range. It seems to not be as susceptible to water and is susceptible to contaminants from race fuels. And we'll find that customers will tell us that an NTK sensor in, in a leaded environment will last two, three, maybe even four times longer than a Bosch sensor. One of the downfalls of the NTK sensor is that it doesn't read quite as rich as the Bosch ones. So its lambda range is 0.69 to out, out to fresh air. It's uh, more expensive than the Bosch ones, but again, if you are using the sensor in a leaded environment, so race fuels or you know, a year or two ago leaded fuels were everywhere, then the NTK sensor was probably a better choice for long, long term uh, lastability, if that's the right word to use, which it isn't. <laughs> you can identify that NTK sensor by the grey connector, grey square connector gives you an idea and uh, there's a certain colour uh, range on the wiring. Okay, the next sensor that arrived on the market was the Bosch LSU 4.2. I mean, I know they all look very, very similar. The sensors themselves, we cells down at the thread and the, uh, the body of the sensor. You can identify the 4.2. It's actually written on it, 4.2, uh, if you look closely. And the connector for the 4.2 is a, an oblong connector, similar to the NTK in its shape and size, but it's obviously black. And... Uh, 
yeah, as I say, 4.2 is written on the sensor itself. Like other Bosch sensors, its lambda range is 0.65 to lambda 32. The last sensor that came out, uh, the most recent uh, one that we have available to use on our ECUs is the LSU 4.9. That one has a, uh, an, a rounded connector at one end and allows you to identify it. It's actually not written on it that it's a 4.9. Um, this is the latest from Bosch and is actually considerably cheaper than earlier sensors. Um, it again reads out from 0.65 to lambda 32. So that's a really good range and uh, with it being quite affordable, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly the sensor of choice. Our new product, the LTC, which stands for Lambda to Can, is a simple, uh, simple little black box that reads Lambda sensors, uh, actually reads the only the LSU 4.9. Uh, that device allows you to connect one or two Lambda sensors to it and puts the Lambda information on a CAN bus. It allows you to, to connect up to 16 Lambda sensors all on the same CAN bus. Now, if the sensor is purchased from MoTeC, we do a pre-calibration test or uh, process on each Lambda sensor when it comes in. And they'll write on the uh, on the sensor itself a calibration number and you can see here the first test someone will put it through the calibration process and write on it in, in uh, black pen and then uh, someone has the unfortunate task of trying to scribe the number into the sensor and the printing's perhaps not as good as it should be but you can see it's still got the number 885 there so if you purchase a sensor from us We've done that calibration for you, and this allows you to enter that number direct into the EC. See that shortly. Just covering the wiring of the sensor. The sensor itself, this one here, is the LSU 4.9, and now we can see by looking at the end of the connector how the connector is shaped. You can see the six pins are labelled, and this is a copy of our data sheet. If you buy a sensor from us or of any description on our website, it should actually come with a data sheet, but on our website is a full list of data sheets. And on this data sheet, it tells you the pinout of the connector of the particular sensor and where you need to connect it. Also, uh, you can you will see that I've written on here the, the calibration number, the scribed calibration number, and again, we'll use that shortly. So in this particular sensor, we have pin 1 is what they call IP, and IP is current, and so that's the pump current, and in this particular sensor, the color of that wire is red. Pin 2 is 0 volt, and on this particular sensor, it's yellow. Pin 3 is heater minus, and again, this one is white, and the heater minus, or the heater negative, goes to an auxiliary output on the ECU. Now that could be one of eight or more outputs that you can connect that to. So there's no, no specific pin that you need to connect that to. It's just any auxiliary output. Pin four in this case is heater plus. So that means it's connected to the battery 12 volts. Then there's on pin five on the sensor is the resistor one, which is not used in the ECU. And VS is the sense voltage. It's the, the, the sense of voltage uh, from the sen sensor itself. And that gets connected to the appropriate Lambda 1 sense pin on the ECU. So now we can have a look at uh, the numeric places that you could connect this to on the ECU. So IP, if you're connecting it as Lambda 1, goes on an M400, 600, 800 ECU onto B26. On an M880, it's pin number 60. And the name, the name that we give it is Lambda 1 Pump, or P. So here you can see each, each name that the sensor is given and the pin to connect it to and what we call that on the ECU. So that's LA1 Lambda 1 Sense. 
the heater minus, which is the auxiliary output, that can, as you can see here, can go on A1, A23, A31, A33. All of those are auxiliary outputs, so you can connect to any spare auxiliary output with this particular wire. And then, as we said, last screen, heater plus needs to go to the, uh, the battery. Now, obviously, we don't connect it direct to the battery. You're going to connect it to a, a wire that is already um, connected to the ECU. And in the case of an M800, that's A26 is the main power feed. So anywhere on that wire, you'd make a, a, a nice splice and splice in the power. A lambda sensor, for the record, draws about up to five or six amps when it first starts up cold. And then when the engine's running, and if the engine's running at around 700 degrees Celsius, the exhaust temp is around 700 degrees Celsius, well, it'll be less than an amp to drive it. Um, at, at idle, uh, the engine, um, the exhaust temp might be two or 300 degrees Celsius, so the lambda sensor might draw about one amp. So you need to make sure the wiring is capable of sustaining that, those currents. Okay, so here's a, uh, the wiring diagram that we include in the help for the ECU, and it's one that I always refer back to diagrams that look like this to help me understand the wiring. And you can see here the Lambda 1, in this case, what, what we're configuring is going into LA1 sense, LA1 pump, 0 volt is going to auxiliary volt power. Uh, you could also put it on a, a zero volt engine, which we suggested earlier, and there's actually it's actually a third zero volt, but we don't want people to connect to there. That that should stay dedicated that zero volt to our comms connector, so that should only be used for, for comms. So don't connect zero volts from any sensors to B14 here. Leave that for the communications plug. All right, and then the auxiliaries, you can see here on my example, I've circled auxiliary 5. It could go on auxiliary 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, whichever one you like, and 12 volts. So that's where you would want to connect your lambda sensor. All right, assuming you've got that job done correctly, and I want you to make a great job of doing that wiring because it'll come back to bite you if you don't do it properly. We now need to get into ECU Manager and uh, set this up. There's kind of two major things to set up here when it comes to a Lambda sensor. First thing we have to do is calibrate the heater. Now, if you don't do this, it's not going to work. So we go and choose an auxiliary output that is free. In this case here, we've only got one other one being used, which is auxiliary 6, which is the fuel pump. And you'll go to auxiliary one if that's our choice and we want to configure it as a lambda heater so when you go to auxiliary output one if it's not configured as anything if it's off like auxiliary two we go across to function and then once we're in function we can push f1 now f1 will give us a list of all the things that we can configure onto an auxiliary output now there's 10 20 30 different things we can get an auxiliary output to do the number that we want to use to be a lambda heater is listed there, and it's number 9. And you can see down here we've entered 9. All right, so number 9 is what you enter, and that says to the ECU, I'm a lambda heater, and it needs to work like a lambda heater and configure inside the electronics to operate that sensor. The next thing we want to do is in the parameters for the lambda heater, we need to tell it, it's a very simple one, this one, we need to tell it, is this Lambda 1 or Lambda 2? In an M600 and an M800, you, have, you can actually configure two Lambda sensors, one for each bank, obviously. So at this point, we need to tell us if this is the first Lambda sensor or the second one, so Lambda 1 or Lambda 2. If you have an M400, then you only get one choice, it's Lambda 1, because that's what you can configure in an M400. Now we move on to the sensor setup. You can see the uh, the tree, uh, the menu tree of how to get to where we need to be. So you can push escape, then go to adjust, down to sensor setup, then across and over to wideband lambda setup, and across and to the sensor setup itself. This one here is quite uh, well. They're all you've got to get them all right, but this one here you have to make a, a couple of decisions on. First of all, we need to know what sensor you've connected. So uh, if you haven't 
been the person to wire it in, you're going to need to know what that sensor is. So identify it via connector, ring the guy who fitted it. We need to find out which sensor you've got. Once you've got that sorted, let's uh, go with an example of an NTK. You then have two choices. You can drive the sensor in two different ways. We can drive it in what we call a normal mode. Now, in a normal mode, the ECU won't actually turn the heater of the sensor on until the engine is warmed up. The reason it does that is that when uh, a sensor is being driven hard by the heater, the, the tip of the sensor itself glows red hot. Now, if we were to start that sensor up when the key went on, and you started the engine and it had a lot of condensation in it and some of that condensation landed on the sensor itself then it shatters the little porcelain uh, sensor inside so that makes it less reliable obviously and it's not a situation you want to uh, optionally occur so if you put normal number two normal for the NTK this will turn the sensor on once the engine started warming up and it, it might be at about 50 degrees Celsius, it'll turn the, start to heat the sensor up. Now that is good for normal operation, but if you want to, for instance, tune the cold start and you need the sensor to be reading right from when the engine starts, then you need to choose number three in this case for fast heat. So what that does is as soon as the key is turned on and the ECU is powered up, the ECU starts uh, turning the heater on in the sensor. The heater drives the sensor and allows it to get up to around 650 degrees Celsius and that allows it to start working. So that the moment you turn the key and start the engine, you will get a lambda reading. And that way you can see if it's maybe too lean or too rich and allow you to tune the cold start. So if you not doing cold start tuning and you're only going to do hot tuning then I'd suggest you start with number two or the normal strategy on, on the particular sensor that you're using. All right so uh, the next thing to install we've got the type of sensor done and the next uh, down the menu item to calibrate or to install is the number for the, calib the calibration number. Now, if you recall, if you purchased the sensor from us, we had a number written on there. And in this case here, you'll see up the top, I'm pointing at the 885. And Lambda sensor cal number here, for Lambda 1, we've already installed 885. That's all you need to do. If you don't have a pre-calibration number there, or if the sensor is old and has been in the engine for some time, we can perform an air calibration. Now to perform an air calibration, that's the next item down on the menu. All right, on this page here, we can see we're on a, it almost looks like the same page, but we're actually in the Lambda sensor air calibration. Now in this page, the ECU turns the heater on and starts a calibration happening. This is called a fresh air calibration, so you need to remove the lambda sensor from the exhaust. If you leave the lambda sensor inside the exhaust, you will get a completely wrong reading here. So the sensor must be removed, and then you carefully hang that sensor out of the exhaust and away from any hydrocarbons or anything that can influence it. It should be in fresh air. So don't hang it near the fuel cap or if, the, if you've spilled fuel somewhere or anything like that and the fuel in the dyno room or anything like that, you've got to get it in uh, fresh air. And fresh air, I believe, is 20.6% oxygen. And this calibration basically says what we should be reading now is 20.6 oxygen. So the ECU will perform a calibration at this point. And when you're in the screen and the uh, the, the cursor or the highlighting is on this number here, this number should start to scroll. Okay, so it should be moving around the place. It might start down at 200 and, and scroll up to 1200 and then down to 800. It'll be moving all around the place while it settles and gets its calibration. Eventually, it'll kind of stop moving, uh, you know, within a plus or minus 20 or 30 number range. Um, it, it'll always kind of flicker a little bit. Once it kind of settles down into one particular area, 
you push enter and lock it in. After that, uh, it's probably best to just push F5, which takes you through to the fuel table. It also forces a reset and basically locks, locks the, the number in. And after that, basically the system's calibrated. Okay. At that point, the lambda sensor should be reading. If you've got the engine up to temperature and it's going, we can look at a chart recorder of the lambda reading up on the uh, ECU manager screen. Here's a, a, a capture of that chart recorder. So if you've got a lambda table configured and you've got a number in the lambda table, you should have a straight line for wherever your engine's idling at if, if it's an idle test. And what we'd like to do is just to make sure the lambda sensor is operating correctly, you should uh, go to the overall fuel trim and maybe put in 20%. We then expect to see the lambda sensor go rich. Then if you removed, say, 40%, so instead of going to plus, tw plus 20, you went to minus 20, we'd expect to see the lambda sensor do that. The numeric numbers are up the top here. So you can see them moving there, but what we're looking at in this particular case is a nice line here and it should move quickly. So as you type that trim in and push enter, I'd expect to see the lambda sensor reading move quickly as well. This will let us know that you've uh, successfully done the setup and you can proceed and basically start your tuning. Alright, if it doesn't work, what do we do? If the lambda sensor is not working, I'd suggest it's probably going to pop up an error. Now, if you press V for view, you will end up on the sensors screen. And on the sensors screen, you, you see all the sensors that are, are configured in your ECU. You'll see your map sensor, throttle sensor, uh, air temp, engine temp, all those things. And you'll also see the lambda reading. Now, that lambda reading is, uh, if it's not working, then there'll be an error sitting there. C1, C3, something like that will be sitting there. Now, if you get that error, and if you press F1, you will get uh, a list of what that error means here. But when the lander sensor first starts up, it goes through a warm-up cycle, and you'll see in that, if you're in this particular screen, C1, C2, C3, and then it should click and start reading. You can see by reading on the screen here that there's a number of different errors and different things that can be wrong. Okay, and that, to, obviously you're not going to be looking at this presentation when you're sitting on your laptop. So the way to find out any information in any of our screens is to press F1. And there's always plenty of help in the background waiting to inform you. All right, and uh, all going well, you won't get any errors. Uh, everything will, will work well and you can begin your tuning and, and uh, life will be good if all going well. All right, so that's about it for the webinar. Thank you, for everyone, for attending. If you want to find out uh, more about the webinars we do and you want to view this uh, webinar later, this is where you'll go to our website and forward slash webinars. And if you need some help, uh, you can obviously write into our support network or on our forum there. There's really good help. Lots of people on there usually willing to help and give you an answer as quickly as possible. Now, if there's any questions, we can hang around for a minute or two and you can ask them. Otherwise, that will be the conclusion of the webinar.